G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Native a huge shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, with the holiday season right around the corner, we're all getting into the spirit by indulging in the sights and the sounds and the scents of the season. And one thing I made sure to do was to update my Native collection with their candy cane holiday scent. I also chose the blood orange and the clove scent for my seasonal pack. Man, does it smell good. I just love the smell of clove oil too because when I was younger, my mum used to use it for cleaning her house and it always just smelled so fresh. And that smell always just brings me back too, which is really nice. As always too, the performance has been fantastic. And Native is the perfect addition to your daily routine this holiday season. Native deodorants don't just block odor better, they're made better. Native has ingredients that you've heard of like coconut oil, shea butter. It's also vegan and never tested on animals. And Native never uses ingredients that shouldn't be in deodorant, like aluminium, parabens, sulfates, or talc. Their candy cane gift set also makes for a great gift option, and all Native products are great stocking stuffers for everyone on your list. Native is risk-free to try. Every product comes with free shipping from the US, plus free 30-day returns and exchanges. You can also see why so many people love Native and check out the over 14,000 five-star reviews. And lastly, I also just want to mention that they have this great initiative going on at the moment that I've been really impressed by. It's called the Plastic Free by 23 initiative. Native is pushing hard to try and provide a plastic free option for every single one of their products and donating 1% of every plastic free sale to nonprofits specializing in environmental stewardship, which personally, I think is great. So, give the gift of Native by going to nativedo.com slash scared or use promo code scared at the checkout and get 20% off your first order. Make sure you order before December 7th to get your products in time for Christmas. That's nativedo.com slash scared or use promo code scared. Around 2006-ish, I was driving flatbed, picked up a load of construction material, drywall, roofing. Don't remember really, but it was pre-packaged in boxes, and I remember having to use strap protectors on the load, in rural Tennessee. Now, my memory is foggy now, but I want to say that it was between Memphis and Nashville, but closer to the intersections of the MSALTN state lines. Anyway, tarp required, so I strapped everything down tarped the load and left the shipper. About five miles down the road, in the middle of nowhere, woods on a two-lane road, I noticed my tarp flapping in the wind. I found a wide shoulder and I pulled over to fix it. I realized pretty quickly too that I just flat out did a terrible job tarping this load and decided to just redo the whole thing on the side of the road. So I undo all the bungee straps and drag the tarps off roll them back up, climb up on the load and start unrolling the tops again. And I see a guy walking down the road, the same side of the road that I'm on, coming towards my truck. I don't really think anything of it, other than to keep an eye on him because well, I'm in the middle of nowhere and I just continue what I'm doing. About the time that I have the top set in place and am climbing down to start hooking the bungee straps back on, this dude is getting pretty close now, enough so that I'm now paying more attention to him than I am to tarping my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer where I'm working, just in case. It's an 8 pound solid metal bar about 4 feet long, tapered to a blunt end on one end and it's also hollow on the other. It's used for tightening straps and chains and stuff like that. So the guy gets to me and the first thing that I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet, but it's sort of really patchy. Like he tried to cut his own hair or something and maybe had a seizure in the process and said, eh, good enough to party. The next thing I noticed though were his eyes, which I can only describe as just off. Like they were clear. I didn't think that he was drunk or high or anything, but... It also just gave me the distinct impression that the elevator just didn't go all the way up there. His clothes were dirty and not well maintained, with dirty white tennis shoes. And I remember this because he didn't have laces on one shoe and the tongue was noticeably out of place too. He stops by me, 
waits until I acknowledge him and just says, I've got a long walk. I'm like, uh, yeah, man, you do you. We're in the middle of nowhere. But making it clear that there's no ride to be had here. He nods, though, starts walking by me, continuing on his way. Stops at about the driver door on my truck and turns around. Comes back to me and repeats himself. I've got a long walk, he says. At this point, I explain that I just can't give him a ride, insurance and all that. Apologize for not being able to help him out. And he seems to accept this, turns around and he leaves. I wait for him to get a little ways away from my truck and I start working on finishing the tarp job. I still keep an eye on him, of course, and he's moving away from me now. And as I'm putting on the last of the bungee straps, I just look over to check where he's at, and he's turned around heading back towards me again, now about a hundred yards in front of my truck, and coming back my way. It looks like he's maybe talking on a cell phone? He has his hand to his face, and I can barely make out his mouth moving. His other hand is waving like he's having a conversation with someone, but... I finish with the straps, grab my winch bar, and am climbing into my truck as he's about 10 yards away now, and as soon as I'm in the cab, I lock the doors immediately and set the winch bar on the passenger seat just in case. I look at the guy and realize that he's not talking on a phone, he's talking to his hand, and now I'm beginning to get a bit nervous because he doesn't look like he's having a nice pleasant chat. Instead, it looks more like an angry conversation. Either way, I crank the truck up to put it into gear and just pull out and didn't look for traffic or anything. As I pass him, he's just looking at me, still holding his hand to his face with a dead look and just staring at me. It gave me the creeps and about the time that I hit fifth or sixth gear, I look in the mirror and all of a sudden... There's just nobody there. When my ex and I first got together, we stayed at his dad's place out in the high desert of California. There's nothing really much out there but sand, drugs, and old people. His dad's place was a sort of sublet of types. There was a house and I guess what you might call apartments attached to it. The apartment had a living room, a bedroom, it had a kitchen and a bathroom too, all confined in a really tight space though. His dad was an older man in his 80s, always slept on the couch, and my ex said that that's just how it's always been too. Now, I've been sensitive to things like ghosts and spirits and the like all my life, my first experience being when I was less than a year old outside the church of my great uncle's funeral where I alerted my cousin who was holding me to his apparition on the other side of the street. That's a story for another time for sure but it's just always been like this for me and I really don't know why. But anyway, that place just always made me nervous. I knew immediately that something was just wrong there, so wrong. In the bedroom, there was enough room for a queen-size bed, bedside tables on either side, and a large closet with one of those sliding doors. Since I was a child, I've always had a rule of keeping closet doors closed at night. There were places that I often saw things, especially ones that never walked this earth or were supposed to anyway. And I remember this one night specifically. I was laying in my bed with my ex, and I suddenly felt a panic attack coming on. The weight in the room had shifted, and there was just something there. And in the dark, the closet door was open. There was a reason for this, and I'll circle back to that later, but I had always had issues sleeping there, especially near that closet. But that night, I looked into the darkness, and I saw something. My breath hiked up in my chest, and my ex asked me what was it. I said, I see it. It lives in the closet. And I knew something had lived there, but this was the first time that it was letting me see it. My ex got really silent all of a sudden, and then he told me that he believed me, that he knew something terrible lived in that closet. How it had attached to his father, he doesn't know, but 
He said that his dad, this man in his mid-80s, would burst in at like 2 or 3 or 4 in the morning and scream and wake him or us up if that closet door was closed. He would fling it back open, storm out and go back to the couch in the living room. He had been doing this since they moved into this place. I think that's why he always slept on the couch, but what I saw was definitely not a human or even humanoid. It had teeth and sort of cat-like ears and eyes. I could see the teeth glistening through and they were yellow. It was smiling at me maybe. I observed it slowly, trying to breathe and see if it would tell me anything really what it wanted, who it was working for, how it came to be, just anything. I can usually get things to talk to me like that, but this thing continued to just stare and smile at me. I immediately got out of bed and I fled to my car outside. I began texting different friends to try and figure things out. I wanted to be told, was it going to hurt me? Was I in danger by staying there? Why had it shown itself to me now? My ex was screaming at me that if I play into it, that if I used pagan ways of handling it, that it would get worse. He was an orthodox Jew and he had his own beliefs, especially about mine. But I just started to refuse going there after this, refused staying there, refused pretty much everything in fact. My ex and I, we had a bit of a toxic relationship so it wasn't hard to cut ties to that house in the end which I'm actually grateful for. Months passed by and eventually he told me that his dad had suffered a major injury in this house. He had slipped and hit his head and hit his head so badly in fact that he was barely able to function now. It's sad but his father will probably die alone in that house and with this thing in the closet and there's not a thing anyone can or will do to save him. His daughter is trying to get him to move in with her, I believe, or was at least. I don't know, but my ex and I have not had contact over the last few months, but I believe that this thing in the closet is probably attached to him, that it's been feeding off of him for so long that even if he does move, it'll come with him. I just really hope that whatever injury his brain sustained is enough to make him not too afraid because perhaps that's a mercy in February of 2013 I was dating my wife at the time we decided to take a trip to a resort on Lake Delavan in Wisconsin the weather was cold but not unusually so and we thought that it would be a neat getaway to set the stage the place was pretty much deserted when we arrived. It's mostly a summer attraction for families from Illinois to come on vacation. There's a beach where you can go swimming and also a nearby golf course. People also frequently use the resort for weddings. However, when we were there, there was a thick layer of snow on the resort grounds and the lake was frozen over from months of sub-freezing temperatures. And not even Valentine's Day was enough to attract more than a handful of guests. We checked in and were directed to our room, which was about two-thirds of the way down a long deserted hallway. The hallway had a long line of rooms on the left side, which faced the lake. Walking to the room was kind of eerie because we passed an arcade that was completely deserted, and there was no sign of anyone else staying in that wing for the night. The hallway was also completely empty and silent. When we arrived at the room, it seemed nice enough and had a pretty view of the frozen over lake. There was one bed adjacent to the wall nearest the bathroom, which was on the right side when you entered the room. We decided to go out and walk on the ice. As my wife was from a warmer climate and had never done so before, we thought that it would be neat. And when we returned, the first strange thing happened. So as I opened the door to our room, I realized that I had left the light on. However, it abruptly turned off when we entered the room. It looked like one of those lights that has a timer and a motion sensor, so I dismissed it as just a coincidence. The rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. We went to dinner at the resort restaurant and had a couple of glasses of wine. We were pretty tired too by this time, so we ended up going to bed pretty early. And I must have woken up at around 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd say, with just a really uneasy feeling. 
The room felt like someone turned the heat off. As I shook off the fogginess of my sleep, I then noticed a figure standing next to the bed. My hair instantly stood up on end, and as I tried to make out what it was, I realized that it was a woman with dark hair and a light-colored dress who was sort of glowing. But before I could make out any more detail, she just sort of dissipated right in front of my eyes. I sort of rubbed my eyes a bit and just sort of dismissed this as maybe a a weird dream, a, a lucid dream, sleep paralysis maybe, and eventually just drifted back to sleep. But about an hour later, I woke up again with that same feeling. She was back, however, this time I was able to make out more detail. She appeared to be Native American, I would say, and had braided hair with a light-colored traditional dress. I didn't get the sense that she wanted to harm me or anything. She eventually dissipated again without saying anything or really moving. But as I laid in bed, paralyzed by what I experienced, my wife abruptly sat up. Thinking that she was awake, I said, Honey, are you up? But got no response. Her eyes were still closed and she laid back down again. Later she told me that she didn't have any memory of doing this. I didn't get to sleep for a long time that night, but... Also didn't experience anything else after that, which I was grateful for. Next morning, we woke up and were laying in bed just talking. But we hadn't been dating that long at that time, and I was afraid of making her think that I was crazy by telling her what had happened. But finally, though, I decided to do it and see if she remembered anything from the night before. And as I recounted my story, the lights on the headboard above us flickered on and off. They were turned off at that time too, so I found this to be very strange. Later that morning, we went into the bathroom and also noticed that the sink was on full blast. And neither of us recalled even using the sink that morning, let alone putting the sink on full blast like that. We checked out that day and asked the hotel receptionist, in passing, whether or not the resort had any reports of being haunted. I sort of expected them to laugh it off, but... I instead got a very defensive vibe and denial from them. I later researched the lake and the resort and found out that the grounds were home to Native American burial mounds and was apparently known to be haunted. I had no idea that this was the case before we went. I even found a post discussing how staff reported seeing a woman in a white dress who would wander the halls of the resort. I can't help but wonder if that was the woman that I saw that night. This story happened to my grandmother, and truth be told, it was during their life before she and my mum moved out from their home village, and she experienced quite a few strange things there, and this is one of them. So my grandmother lived in a small village, like I said, and was working as a postwoman. Her job allowed her to meet and talk with old people at the time who told her some spooky and supposedly true stories about the area or people living there and whatnot. Being a postwoman also meant that she had to travel quite a bit to deliver mail as there were fields, forests, and some people lived further from the center of the village. During spring, summer, and autumn, when the roads were pretty good, she used a bike mostly, and when it was winter or very muddy, she took her horse with a wagon. This happened in the winter or late autumn because she took her horse. And as I mentioned, some people lived quite far away, so she had to cross a forest in order to deliver some mail. As she was going back, she took another rat in the forest, and somehow she just ended up going in circles. Now, let me say this too, that this was a forest that she traveled numerous times and never got lost before. I mean, it was literally a straight shot in and a straight shot out, and was pretty difficult to get lost. But for some reason, she recalled that old folks told her a story once that there was a mansion there that sank into the ground instantly during a wedding feast, and only a priest managed to escape, and everybody else went to the ground with the house. Supposedly years passed and Forrest took over the place, but somehow it always remained sort of sinister after that. My grandmother figured that this must be the same place because she'd heard that whoever walks into this territory ends up going in circles. 
and she spent a good half of the day trying to just get out of there, but no matter where she turned, she ended up just going in circles. Round and round she went without being able to escape, and then as she got really tired, she just gave up and spoke to a horse. She asked him to take her home and release the reins, thus giving her horse total control and freedom, and that horse brought her home. And it turns out that she spent a good 8 hours in there because it was already night when she returned. To this day as well, she really can't explain what happened there. Like I said, that accident occurred after years of work. She was born in that village, so she knew the place like the back of her hand. And how she spent 8 hours in that forest, unable to escape, is honestly beyond her. Fall 2017. I was 18 and starting my freshman year at a huge university, 8 hours away from my home. Quite a lot was going on in my life as this was the first time ever moving cities and my first time living parent free after 18 years of living with limited independence in a strict household. I was going through all of the wacky cultural shock and mental emotional challenges most college freshmen go through within the first few days of moving into campus. And this was my very first day of classes. So after my last class, which was pretty late and ended around 5.30pm, I stopped by a food court to pick up something to eat. I was too hungry to wait to get back to my dorm, so I sat alone at a bench in a courtyard between two buildings and started eating. And yes, I know walking and eating alone was probably a pretty stupid idea, but I was naive and figured that at a huge college campus, I would only be surrounded by other lost and confused students just like me. I also had no friends since I moved into this city or school not knowing a single person, and my raging social anxiety made me hesitant to try meeting new people. But anyways, I was alone on a bench eating my food when an odd looking couple approached me, a tall, muscular, bald man and a petite, Latina, Asian looking woman with glasses and Bob style haircut who was holding a few books. The man was completely silent, but the woman enthusiastically approached me, introducing herself as Carmen, in a sort of ambiguous accent. She didn't even introduce the man, and he just kind of stood there silently. She started asking me stuff like my name, the year, where I was from, what I was majoring in, before telling me that she was from a Bible study group here in the city that a lot of college students find interesting. She opened a Bible and started reading me some random passage before explaining it, and continued to talk more and more about this group. She asked if I'd be interested, and I quickly shot her down by explaining that I had no time in my schedule with my classes. I took my phone out of my pocket to check the time. She had been lecturing me for about 20 minutes at this point, and I made some weird ridiculous lie that I can't remember about how I had to leave immediately. She then snatched my phone from me and was like, wait, before you leave, I'm going to give you my contact information so you can let me know later if you're still interested, and proceeded to put a number in my contacts. As I said, I was deep in culture shock of the whole brand new college freshman experience. I was terribly shy and I didn't have the confidence to be assertive in this kind of situation. So I just let her do her thing and she gave me my phone back and I headed back to my dorm. But when I approached my dorm, I realized that I didn't have my keys or wallet, even though I swore I was holding them at the time that the couple had approached me. I frantically ran back to the bench area and searched it thoroughly, went through my backpack, went through the nearby trash can, and nothing. I couldn't get into my dorm without my keys or ID, so I just crumbled to the ground crying, and I called my dad in a panic. This was my first time ever losing my keys or wallet in public, days after moving to a new city, and for an insecure 18 year old, it felt like my life was practically over. My dad could only do so much from 8 hours away, so he instructed me to call the campus police. I did, and an officer arrived and asked me for details of where I was, what my things looked like, and all that stuff. I didn't mention the odd Bible study couple to him at all because in such a panic I didn't think to consider that they might have had an involvement or any way of reaching my things out of my backpack. I still feel very incredibly stupid for not providing this detail. 
but the officer gave me temporary dorm access and instructed me to contact the PD daily to check if any missing items turned up. I was overcome with relief when I finally received an email two or three days later from an RA in a dorm halfway across campus saying that my keys and my wallet were turned in to their lost and found. I never did see that couple around campus again. I avoided going places alone other than class and a few months later I was scrolling through social media to see multiple posts about an ongoing sex trafficking ring in the area that would target college students by introducing themselves as Bible study groups. My stomach instantly dropped. It sounded way too similar to the couple that approached me before my belongings mysteriously just disappeared. Three years later and I still feel like an utter and complete idiot for being more freaked out over my missing things more than the encounter of these two strangers who potentially were predators.